Sanders, who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome to the Wow Report here on Radio Andy Series XM. This is Tom Campbell. I'm the Chief Creative Officer at World of Wonder, whatever that means. And I am joined today by the wonderful... James St. James. Oh, my God. Club Hello. Kitchen best-selling author. That's me. Uh, we have a special guest star, Morgan McMichael, hot off a searing Ooh. first episode Ooh. of All Stars 2. Thank, three, excuse me. Thank you for sure. being Thank here. Thank you. We're so excited to have you join us here at the table. And if you haven't noticed, those of you who are watching, because we are also on YouTube, um, live via FaceTime, no expense spared, <laughs> um, our fearless leader Fenton Bailey is reporting live from the Sundance Film Festival. As you know, each week we count down the top 10 things that make us go, wow. wow! And so without further ado, let's kick in with Fenton at number 10. Number 10. All right, so yes, I am at the Sundance Festival. I'm very lucky because uh, my husband, Billy, has uh, is on the jury for World Docs. And as his husband i get what's called a companion pass which basically means here's the thing about sundance tickets are incredibly hard to get it's really complex but if you get the companion pass you can see any film go to anything you just walk in show your badge i mean it's amazing oh. um so i've been here a few days and i've been seeing just docs i always see docs and on a couple of days ago i saw the most amazing uh double bill it was the uh uh, seeing All Red, which is a documentary about Gloria All Red, the uh, attorney. And then, wait beforehand. Do you have an did you do you have an opinion about her? Do you love her? Do you hate her? Did you walk into it feeling one way or the other? Well, here's the thing. I suppose I went into seeing All Red with I don't know. She she has a kind of reputation, right? She's a bit She's of very, a very and Yes, and I'm I was amazed in the documentary how much people hate her. Yeah, I never hated her, but she's really. A figure of uh, people really hate her viscerally. But what's so interesting, obviously, with this film coming at this Me Too moment, they just had the the Women's March, they had a rally here, they had them all over the country. It couldn't be more time. And it's so revelatory in the sense that Gloria Allred was out there protesting sexual discrimination, abuse. Um, she was doing. She's been doing this for decades. I mean, she's. She's uh, 76 years old, and she still goes from city to city. She carries her own luggage. I mean, she's a real workhorse. Fenton, and is it fair to say that she, she, mm -hmm. she had been part of, like, every major trial yes. story for, like, the past three or four decades? Right. Well, she, but... she first gained notoriety with the Save On drug store, where she went after them for having separate aisles for girls' toys and boys' toys. Oh. But, but isn't she, she a bit of an ambulance chaser? In, in, no. In... No, she is a brilliant spectacle manager. Okay. She, she's only she, perceived that way because she's a woman. She knows that uh, the of, Very possibly. The court of public opinion is really important. She's representing 28 of the Bill Cosby women, uh, three of the Trump people. And she, you know, you think she's a bit of a robot and a bit of a publicity seeker. I, I get it. But the backstory is so intense of, I mean, it's a Me Too story. Not to give it away, but she is a victim of rape. And there's this amazing moment in the film where the interviewer says, is that the worst thing that ever happened to you? Basically, she was taken by a doctor, went out on a date. He took her to an abandoned place and raped her. And so she, uh, the question is, was that the worst thing that ever happened to you? And she's like, no, it wasn't. So the interviewer says, well, what was? And she says, after that rape, I was pregnant. I went to get an abortion at a time when you couldn't really get abortions. Mm. She became infected and ill. She almost died. I mean, and after that, you understand, you know, you un she is has a singular focus on power. And it's just incredibly moving. And the end of the film is amazing because her back is to us. Tom, you and I have met her. We went to see her and it was perhaps too early. But she's d d at the back and they say, well, what do you think about things? And she says... The fight has only just begun. And it's so powerful. And then to go from that into this film called RBG, which is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, another incredibly driven, powerful figure who, I mean, I guess has also become something of a sort of um, icon. You know, she's known as the notorious RBG. I was going to say. Oh, my God, she was there. She's 84 years old. <laughs> 
that in Yonis, it was it was like a historical moment. Was she wearing um, a glittery Vegas top by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> no, but she's embraced her pop culture status, hasn't she? She's really got this wry sense of humor. And what I didn't know about her is that she was supported. She had the most amazing love story. Um, a husband who supported her. She wasn't even on the list for the Supreme Court. But her husband, who was also a lawyer, went out and campaigned and got her the meeting with Clinton, and that sealed it. So wow. it's it's an incredible, incredible story. And so I was weeping after seeing All Red, and then I went straight into RBG and was weeping. I was just like, but happy tears, kind of like, and you realize, fuck. I mean, whatever people say about the Me Too movement being excessive at points, the history of abuse of women in this country is, it's epic. Like, you know, you could be fired for being pregnant. You couldn't, you know, your husband could rape you. I mean, uh, it's an amazing epic story. And of course, the timing for both of these documentaries is, is perfect. And of course, there's still one more film, uh, a great biopic uh, about Jane Fonda. That's coming to HBO. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is coming to CNN. And Seeing All Red is coming to Netflix. Three amazing portraits of incredibly powerful women who've done so much for uh, for what's happening right now, really. They laid the track. They started it all. So, Fenton, thank you for making us feel like Sundance insiders. Exactly. And Morgan, you were just saying that you just saw Jane Fonda. Yes, I was on Watch What Happens Live uh, with all the other RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars. Yes. Right. And we were assigned uh, characters, so I got Barbarella Jane Fonda. Oh, I fabulous. Know. And I won. Did you have a Barbarella outfit just lying around? No, but I had one made. Okay, of course. Because <laughs> okay. Jane, Jane and Lily were on what's, what, Watch yeah, What Happens Live. Promoting their, uh, and you got their to show. meet them and, and hang out with them now you're all best friends? Yeah, well, I wish, but they, were, <laughs> but they were very drunk and very high, and it was very really? fantastic. Yay. I don't even think Jane Fonda knew where she was That's at one point. hysterical. <laughs> That's the scoop. Still beautiful, though. Still gorgeous. Oh, I know. Amazing. All right, well, let's keep the countdown going. James, what do you have for us at number nine? Number nine. What I want to talk about is that um, I finally broke down and got Hulu. Wow, welcome to the 21st century. I have been talking about Netflix. Morgan, I swear to God, every single episode, every single thing is a Netflix show. That's all I do is sit around and watch Netflix for about the past two years, probably. It feels like three. It, uh, but I finally broke down and bought Hulu, and one of the first things I watched was The Runaways. Explain what The Runaways is for us people over The Runaways 30. is amazing. It's based on a Marvel comic, okay? And the story is is that it's these six kids and they're all sort of from well-to-do families and they're their their parents are all you know they're they're typical teenagers and they're sort of sullen and sulky and their parents are you know wrong yeah you know they're sort of mean to them and blah blah blah, blah and they're all sort of rebelling against their parents and the parents are all having a dinner party one night and the kids are all like sitting in, they're in the basement playing you know games and you know you know what are those games? Video games? Video games. What are the kids playing these things? <laughs> they're playing these things called video games. And they're all just sitting around doing that. And all of a sudden, they do something, and a secret trap door opens. And they notice that there's a secret room going downstairs. And they sort of follow it. And they come to realize that their parents are all supervillains. And they so what they have to they band together and become heroes to take down their parents. And oh, so God. every week, it's, it's the kids. Kids versus the villains, and they don't really. The par their parents don't really realize that they're they're fighting their kids yet. And it's this whole big thing is absolutely adorable. It stars Craig Sulkin, who is one of the people that you came into the office one time, and he came into the office to read for um, the, uh, Menendez? the Menendez brothers, and the whole office just. <laughs> fell, by the way, everybody just fell on the floor, <laughs> flopped around like they were in epileptic seizures because he's so gorgeous. He has these lips that are just like, like, like you've never seen them, like Angelina Jolie. They're like, you've never seen any lips like these before. He's absolutely <laughs> wonderful. One of the... the, the um, That's a uh, regular James Post. Uh, yeah. like <laughs> One of the um, uh, parents is... Um, uh, Oh God! Oh God! Oh God! You know him so well. So you love Hulu just because of this man's lips. Yes, yes. Okay. Kip Purdue is one of the parents. Who's Kip Purdue? Who's Kip Purdue? Is he, wasn't he like a big Olympian? Then who went on to to become a movie star? And he's just one of the most handsome men alive. And he's just this. It's sort of one like, of the best names I've heard this yeah. week. Yeah, well, Kip uh, Purdue. Kip, Kip Purdue. Well, he's, 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 like he looks name. like a Kip Purdue. He's <laughs> very, very rich looking, and he's sort of like got this blonde hair, and he's just very handsome. So just when you think that they couldn't possibly 
actually squeeze another superhero inspired show out. They've done it. The premise right. sounds well, really clever. In right. Marvel, in the, in the, Mar the fact is that Marvel is, has done Inhumans or something. They, they've done a lot of TV shows this year that have all failed on regular network TV. But this is one that they've got. They've taken to Hulu, and it's really good. And it's something that is, is interesting. And you should watch. Well, I think that you know, regular TV. Yeah. Is like CBS and the NBCs. The shows there are not working anymore. No, no. It has to be really standout stuff. Like look, look at RuPaul's Drag Race. It's a standout show that's a unique. There's nothing else like it. So, well, it's interesting because you know um, DC is doing really well on TV. They have Arrow and Supergirl Flash. and Flash and oh, uh, all those, and those all seem to be working. But uh, DC cannot do a movie to save their life. But right, they get it all wrong. Yeah, everything Bubble they do is wrong. It. Wonder Woman, you know, is the oh, exception. I loved Wonder Woman, Wonder, oh, it, but, so but it's the only. But when you think of like Man of the Man of Steel, the, the Henry Cavill, Batman but versus people, Americans have this thing about Christopher Reeve. There will never be an Another Superman. It's true. It's true. We will poor Brandon Ruth. He had the cock of a horse. He was, if you remember, <laughs> in his, they had to eat. They had to CGI his bulge because it was so big. They had to make it. They had actually had to make his bulge smaller. And still, people would not go see that damn movie. And he was so good on that. And and poor. But you're right. I don't think anyone will ever be, be Christian. And Henry Cavill is just all he's wrong. Just for, han I think he's everything. He, he's handsome as hell. But he's dour and he's got that hairy chest. Superman doesn't have a hairy yeah, chest. But look at he can't have you it. can't say that when Ben Affleck is Batman. Bat That's Fleck, horrific. Batfleck is for the fucking birds. You know what I'm saying? Get him out. Get and him Wonder, out. And Wonder Woman saved the Justice League movie. Yeah, it's Thank true. God. It's true. The best wow reports are when James is in a bad mood. So I hold on. Fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> you guys have seen it before. So you think we should see runways? Definitely runaways. Yes. runways. So yes, stream definitely. season one on Hulu. Uh, and let's move on to number eight. Number eight. And uh, it happens to uh, be about Morgan McMichaels. Now, I am going oh. to oh God. say to you listening and watching, if you have not seen the first episode of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars Season 3, which premiered last night on VH1 at 8 p.m., spoiler alert, I'm going to give you a moment, but come back. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, hey. Morgan, what an episode. What well, the hell was going on? Well, what wasn't going on is All-Stars. It's supposed <laughs> to be everything. Now, Morgan, you have the the one of the broadest scopes of the series. You were in season two, yes. which is one of the greatest seasons of all time. Thank you. And <laughs> you are now on All-Stars 3. It's been nine years yeah. in between. Wait, no. are there, were there any other people from from season two? Where Shangela they, was there Shangela, very Shangela briefly. Season two, three, four, five, six, yeah. seven, eight. It was eight, like nine. a drive-by for her on season two. <laughs> <laughs> <It was very laughs> what, what's, what's the biggest difference been in doing press and, and Everything. fan reaction? Everything about it has been different. Talk to me. It's been, it's become, Drag Race has become this animal that has, like, kind of snuck up on everyone. You know, The Voice and uh, American Idol and all these other reality TV shows that are all very similar, by the way, have had super money, super money behind it. And right. it's a big, massive thing on big, massive networks. And Drag Race has been this baby that's just kind of grown and grown and grown. And it's become this massive monster with the most loyal, insane fans, of yes. course. Um, and that's why it's such a force to be reckoned with. And there's nothing else, nothing else like it on right. TV. Right. Now, so. your relationship with the girls, with, with all the girls. Over the years, of course, you have all become family by this point, right? <laughs> yeah. And it was it just an that angry, it, dysfunctional family. Well, that, isn't that the way it's supposed to be, though? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but like but sisters. but but, 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 the, but the same token, I mean, you do love each other. I mean, yes. you do love all of them at this point. Yeah, I'm and the Harry Tuckman of drag. <laughs> I bring them all to California. And, and it, so, what's it like when you had to go back and you had to actually once again vote each other off? What did you? How did you feel about that dynamic? I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> when you, I well, you know, I just thrive in the villainy. Um, <laughs> I love being honest and I love saying what it's supposed to be. And that's that kind of way that Rue is making us vote each other off or keep each other is a way to grow up and answer with great, uh, what is it, with great 
power comes power great, responsibility. great responsibility. And that's absolutely true. If you're going to be America's next drag superstar or you know, all-star, you need to be able to make a decision. You think it's easy for Rue to kick a girl off exactly. every episode on a regular season? It must be gut-wrenching. So here's, if you really want to be me, yes, then here's what I have to deal with. Yes! <laughs> You get it because I find, I without spoiler alerting, people saw All Stars 2, it's like there is so much thought that goes into And I understand. I'm not a queen. I'm not in the public eye. I don't have a Twitter feed that explodes. Thank God. Uh, but everyone's so self-conscious about their decision and why they're doing it. And it feels like the Miss, all of a sudden it turns into the Miss America contest or something. Well, I feel like with um, Drag Race and being on it two times now, yeah. Um, I think when you put your pride and ego aside and actually understand what Rue is looking for and looking at, and yeah. also with the judges kind of seeing what they see, yeah. put your pride aside, put your ego aside. You, you, everybody wants to win and everybody wants to be the star, but understand you did shitty. <laughs> well, and, it is like to me. It's like a physical exercise. It is what we call it the Olympics of drag. It's like a, it's like an obstacle course. Every week it changes, and you're going to get muddy and dirty sometimes. And other times you're just going to like you know all net. You're going to be amazing, but like it, it, it's it's it doesn't. I don't think it defines the. If you have a bad week or a bad challenge, it doesn't define you as a queen. No, and I think that's what over the years uh, drag races it, people see that now well it's interesting because each and every single one of you has grown and changed so much since their their season and it's so interesting when you look back and then you see where they are now i mean i, I just, just throwing out a few i mean i like milk unbelievably the, the i mean the difference between milk i mean the difference it's just it, it's 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 shocking to me right. how fabulous everybody grows after their time on Drag Race. But even this time on All Stars, you know, we're being critiqued by judges, and not the the same judging is not for everyone. You can't have the same way of judging everyone. So right, right. When I hear like Aja say, "Well, Valentina, they love you, and you're everything. <laughs> Did you stone those tights?" <laughs> when she said that, I was like, "The criteria for judging is not the same for everyone because they're not looking." for the same thing from everyone because we're all so different right? right so what they're looking for for me maybe coming out of my shell or or right. not being so nervous right. but they're not looking for that for milk or or shangela because god fucking knows that shangela is certainly not nervous right but they that's <laughs> true but they have yeah, that's very true it's trying to like get you outside your comfort zone yeah. which is a cliche but it's true and to make you the best well-rounded america's next drag superstar well, and 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 hall of fame drag queen of all time well drag race is not you know, we'll always be local queens, we'll always be bar queens, but we're on RuPaul's Drag Race to be in the show business industry, the entertainment industry. We've done, I did all this press this week that blew my mind. We were on TRL and we were in Vanity Fair and we were things that would never happen for you when you were slinging drinks down at Mickey's in, in West Hollywood. And would know? never have happened in season one, two, three, or four. Right. You know I mean? It's like the, the way that the show has exploded over the years, it has become I, so mainstream And now. I'm just so grateful and happy to have been a part of it again. And I've always been a WOW family member, you know, with my little shows here and there and coming in and doing fashion photo review. And I love it. I'm so grateful. We love you. And we love every time you do something with us. Now, we've been pretty good about not spoiling. Right. But but for the but but I'll just say that there seemed to be a lot of hints in the first episode that there might be a chance for queens to get their revenge. That one, two, or more queens may be coming back. So stay tuned. Watch RuPaul's Drag Race All Stars three uh -oh. every Thursday uh -oh. at eight p.m. And speaking of mainstream, just to like put this as a footnote, it's you know if you haven't seen already, RuPaul is on the cover of the New York Times Sunday Magazine this week. I, oh, is that the one with, Ru, with Oprah? Is that the, no, no, this is RuPaul's no, story Ru. on RuPaul, separate. Oh. And, uh, In it, short sleeves. It fills me with pride. What? We used to, we used to Photoshop Ru like into things. <laughs> like we, there's a Tyra cover once and we Photoshop Ru's face. We don't have to Photoshop anymore. RuPaul's on the cover of the New York Times oh, Magazine Sunday. Dong. That is Pack fantastic. I just love the headline of the piece. It's, it's simple. It says, is RuPaul's Drag Race the most radical show on television? Yes! Yes! <laughs> All right. We have to take a quick little break. Uh, before we do, I have empowered Blake. With great power comes great responsibility, Blake. Do you have a trivia question for us? I Shit. do. <laughs> Morgan McMichaels, our, our fabulous co guest co-host, she recently got a famous tattoo covered up. <gasps> what was that tattoo of? A famous tattoo. Yes. Yeah, so this is the 
No, 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 she got it covered wait, wait, up. Wait, wait, I understand. All right, so we will answer that question. We'll continue our countdown of the top ten things that make us go wow. wow right after this. Don't go away. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Welcome back to the Wow Report here on Radio Andy Sirius XM. I'm Tom Campbell. I'm here with James St. James. Woo! Our special guest star, Morgan McMichael. Hello, darling. Paul's Drag Race All Stars 3. And live from Park City, ahead on a music stand, for those of you not watching, <laughs> it's Fenton Bailey. Hi, Fenton. Mwah. Mwah. Oh, I love that. Um, <coughs> as we continue to count down the top 10 things that made us go wow this week, we do have a trivia question. Blake asked, it is Morgan McMichael themed. Blake, please restate the question. Morgan McMichael's recently got one of her famous tattoos covered up. What was it? Now, it's well, on your, your shoulder, you said? see what it is. So this is it now. All right. Uh -huh. And this is the thistle. This is a Scottish flower. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. And I, I know you're a huge pink fan, but I can't imagine you would cover a pink tattoo. No. I would no. never get a pink Is it a tattoo. copyright? Is it like a Superman S? What was there? I want to say a Superman S. I was going to say uh, it was a piece of broccoli because um, it looks like you've changed <laughs> the broccoli into a thistle. <laughs> Morgan. I oh. think it was Madonna, I think, because she's been turned into a thistle, right? So it's Madonna. Okay. What do you, what, what's it the answer? It was Superman. Oh. What? Really? How are we going to tell you where was Superman? It's under here. Oh, that's so interesting. Somewhere in the banks of my memory, I remember you having a Superman tattoo. So now no longer have to deal with copyrights or blurring or anything no. now, right? No. And I oh, just, and was that the issue? Was that you had to no, keep getting just, blurred? I had it when I was I got it when I was sixteen and I, you know, I'm thirty six now and I thought, you know, maybe I'm not looking like Superman. You know, it's funny because I remember <laughs> Kiyoki had a, a Mighty Mouse tattoo that he grew to loathe over the right. years because it was one of those things that he got when he was 18, and then it, now it's like some. I'm too chicken to get a tattoo for that very reason. Me too. Me too. James, do you have any tattoos? I have no tattoos. I don't believe in tattoos. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe in the impermanence of flesh and that I am not the same person that I was a week ago, much less a year ago. And if I would, in the 90s, I probably would have gotten one of those stupid, like, barbed wire things around my bicep. The Celtic. The, the, the Celtic, yes, band. And I would have just, I, I would just hate myself. So <laughs> I, there's no way I could ever do that. Love yourself, James. Let's go on with the countdown back to Park City. City live Fenton Bailey what film do you have for us at number seven number seven well at number seven I have an interesting gem it's called superstar the Karen Carpenter story oh which is the old 1992 right. what year is it that's absolutely right it's not a new film it was made it was one of Todd Haynes's earliest films I think actually it was his first film yeah it's a short film about 30 minutes long and it tells the Karen Carpenter story using Barbie dolls. Barbie dolls, yes. And uh, this is a cult film. Um, it went to Sundance, I think, in 89, but was only released for a few months before it had to go underground. And the reason was that this being an in early independent film, it's filled with the Carpenter songs. <laughs> right. But they just didn't bother to license them. <laughs> Tiny detail. Right. Uh, those were the days. And, of course, Richard Carpenter, who's not portrayed entirely sympathetically, right. uh, ended up cease and desist. He sued them. All copies of the film had to be rounded up and destroyed. And the film has sort of been on YouTube, copies of copies, very degraded. Yes. And it's just become, in the intervening years, a cult, and no one's well, seen it. It's, it's a I bit like what Great Gardens was before that. Be before we were all, we kept hearing about this, this video, and we, everyone knew how legendary it was, but nobody had ever seen it. Right. And I, I, I'd never seen that. In fact, James, I was at the Pyramid in 1988, and I remember they was, we'd done a sound check and setting out the chairs for a screening of, I was like, what are you doing? Oh, we're, we're going to show this film. And that was one of the few screenings, public screenings of this film. Anyway, long story short, they have found a copy and they have restored it. Now, they're not allowed to advertise it. They're not allowed to show it. But I believe that some they're allowed for some reason to restore it and keep it in the archives as long as they don't show it. So a few nights ago at the Egyptian theater, they had an unannounced. Uh, Wait, you saw it here in, in L.A.? No, no, at Sundance, they had an unannounced there. screening of the film. So I got to see the film for the first time. And it's pretty amazing. And I tell you, I mean, uh, people love this film with a sort of craziness that when you actually see the film, I was like, huh, I mean, it's okay. But 
it made me realize like how independent film has transformed and that really 1988 89 we're at the dawn of what we take for granted today as cinema and that sundance really has been this launching pad for some of the whether it's blair witch or saw or clarks or reservoir dogs or sex lies and videotape or more recently get out sundance has been this launching pad for some of the most influential independent films which really have have gone from being sort of real outsider low budget affairs to really what we understand to be cinema today i mean aside from marvel blockbusters right. that's pretty much the movie business is pretty much what sundance created and so it was really interesting um to see it and because i've been coming to sundance for what james 1999 was the first experience with party monster the documentary i remember exactly yeah, yeah. And it was considered so amoral that they put a drunk driving short film before it to sort of don't <laughs> drive. <laughs> so, you know, and I've been back almost every year since with Eyes of Tommy Faye, Part of the Movie, Inside Deep Throat, Becoming Chaz, Grab, Miss Navajo, and of course, Maplethorpe. And it, it's amazing how big it is. I mean, it's like 80,000 people descend here. And, you know, they play 110, this year there's 110 feature length films out of something like 13,468 submissions. Oh, wow. I would want to watch all those submissions. Right? <laughs> That's a lot. Can you imagine? So um, it's pretty great. I mean, it really was great to see it. And Rich Linklater interviewed Todd Haynes and Christine Vachon. And it was just sort of a great sort of milestone. How's I Christine? Suppose. I haven't seen her since Party Monster. Well, of course, she's fabulous. She's um, She was going to buy the Harvey Weinstein Company. Did you know that? Oh, yes, I did hear that. that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, she's also produced Colette, which is uh, Wash, Wash Westmoreland, you know, Wash, who used to work at World of Wonder and yeah. did uh, Gay Republicans. He has directed Colette with Kira Knightley, and that's uh, Killer Films. And uh, Colette, about the 19th century authoress? Indeed. I haven't seen it yet. I'm going to see it like, in a couple of days, but uh, it just sold for, like, millions and millions of dollars. Is so. there any chance they're going to play the Karen Carpenter story again at Sundance? No. That was it. That was we did it. it. I saw it. That's such a special moment. Yeah. All right. Yeah, really well, well. thank it. you, yeah. Fenton, for that inside scoop. We will move on the countdown now to James St. James at number six. Number six. Number six. Um, uh, did you get a chance to see Troy Sivan on Saturday Night Live? I did. You know, wow. he's such an interesting character to me because he's one of those YouTube phenomena. Yeah. Right from Australia, I believe. Is yes. that where he's from? Yes. Uh, just a young little twink, young little kid, pretty little boy, um, with the voice of an angel. It's, I mean, and he's a singer songwriter, one of the best out there. And yet, for some reason, he's not getting uh, Grammys thrown at him. He's not on the cover of Entertainment Weekly. He's not, uh, he, he has a huge following but he doesn't have any mainstream success there's no he doesn't get any radio play at all i don't understand for the life of me what that is i think you buried the headline he's also very out very gay yes oh. he, he, yes he, he's very gay and um he, he came out and to being his, very gay is the best thing we can say about anybody just so anyone yeah listening. yeah no, no, but he <laughs> that's came, so gay he is like a after, blessing sort of after he became famous he 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 announced that he was gay and his songs are very you know homocentric they're very i mean they're very, very gay in a way that um, is, I mean, I guess Sam, Sam Smith is doing, well, he has this new song out called um, My, My, My. Well, he has My, My, My. That's that sexy new video, right? The yeah. really fabulous one. But then he just had a new song and I, and I The Good trying. Side. The Good Side is what the, the new song is. And it's just this beautiful, it's like the voice of an angel. He's so, it's so it's heart-rending and just it's, it's, and it's about what I believe it's about Connor Franta, who is another um, uh, gay YouTube, uh, YouTube music sensation. Person, yes, who was, who was coming to World of Wonder a couple times, and they had had an affair, and this sort of broke his heart. And it's, I just, I don't understand why this kid isn't getting the radio play. I'm hoping that the last week's um, SNL thing will sort of break him up a little, a little bit because he really deserves to be a star much more so than that, you know, Sam Smith, which is music to cut your wrist by I, I, I just <laughs> but the problem is is that Sam Smith is not 
intimidating because he is not as beautiful. Because he's yeah, he's and ugly he's not and, as and, gay. And, he lists, and, that's and he's just truth. awful. That's yeah. just the truth of it. I watched that SNL thing, and that boy is stunning. That boy, and and, and he is a, he's sexual in a way that very few gay pop star. You know, I mean, yeah. um, we he were, just feels know, free. Yeah, but he's not Michael Hutchins either. No. no, and he was trying to move like that kind of Michael Hutchins, Mick Jagger. I was like, no, no, you, you didn't think it worked. I know. I I think it's fascinating that there, you know, because for so long, you know, I, I, boy George, I'd rather have a cup of tea than than have sex, you know. <laughs> yes. And, and then Rue know, George, even talks about he took his sexuality out of his persona in order to like cross over. Exactly. And, and you know, George Michael came along, and George Michael was unabashedly sexy, but he was straight for you for right. the most of he his career. Exactly. He couldn't exactly. But and then the minute he became gay is when he stopped doing the but Troy Savannah is out there just playing with his nips and grabbing yeah, that's his too crotch. Much. Is it well, too what much? What about uh, Rufus Wainwright? He's well, Rufus been- Wainwright is not gay. Is not sexual though. There ain't nothing sexy right. about Rufus Wainwright. But I have a little insight into Troy because Brett McLaughlin who's a huge friend of WOW who writes all the specialty material on Drag Race now which you might be familiar with. He also writes hit songs for Selena Gomez and he's written Troy's biggest hits including he co-wrote on both of these tracks that were in Saturday Night Live. Mm, so mm-hmm. I watched this week not only for Troy, who I love, but because Brett is like a dream come true. Can you imagine two of the songs you've written like right. performed on Saturday Night Live? And Troy is like the one artist I think in the past few years. Everybody's having hits, but like they're all established. Like Selena Gomez is having her third round of hits. It's like Troy is actually breaking in in a different way. And I don't know about the radio thing so much, but the kids don't listen necessarily to the radio. They listen to it on Spotify and on. It's, it's, it's true. Is, we're punished for being who we are and we're we're, we're punished for being unapologetic about it i I like to think that's old thinking that troy is part of this new generation and i love seeing him because he was kind of shy and and reserved and i felt like there was this new kind of realized adult version of him on saturday night live and i loved it no it's true that you don't necessarily need uh, radio play to become famous anymore, but the fact is is that you need it to sort of legitimize you in a way that when you think of who is the DJ that who just died, uh, who just OD'd, who, who was doing all the mixtapes, what's his name, the little cute boy with the pink hair? Oh, uh, little, little, little uh, little what? Peep. Little Peep, yes. And Little Peep is someone who, who who sort of takes that notion that you can have 100 million fans and everything like that, but you really aren't famous until you're getting the mainstream press and you're getting the radio play and everything like that. So he is famous in a way, but he's not somebody who's going to be, uh, in, in 100 years, people are not going to be writing books about him and thinking about him and talking about him because he never had that legitimized. So what is he going to do to stand out to make himself that way, though? That's what, I again, think it's That's happening what, now. I think it's. I think these are going to be big crossover hits. I think being on Saturday Night Live is a huge step in that direction. That's a huge milestone. Yes. And, I, and I do remember that One Direction was sort of the same way, where One Direction had a the huge fan, fan base, yeah. but they didn't have any hit. They didn't have any radio hits, and they didn't. They weren't getting magazine covers or anything until they broke out on Saturday Night Live. But not everybody on Saturday Night Live either. You know, look at Ashley Simpson. Oh, how dare you? On that <laughs> note, Troy Savon, check him out if you haven't checked him out already, uh, streaming everywhere. Uh, Google Images. Let's move on to number five. Number five. Suzanne Summers. No oh God. What is she doing now? Oh God. She, to me, Suzanne Summers is kind of a gay icon. Like we, like oh, when I talk to her, we love and and you and Billy love to watch her in HSN or wherever she's selling her her wares. Her um, swag. You know, and yet she Not was in, in, in a tiny moment. And does it just take this tiny moment? She's walking outside of Medeo Restaurant in West Hollywood. The paparazzi's there. It's like a 39 second clip. And in the last five seconds, they're sort of talking about Trump. And she says, she's like, I like Trump. I like what he's doing. She goes, I know I'm going to lose my career for this, but I think the stock market's great, and I like him. And she gets into her car, and she swirls away, and it has. she has been pounded now by the Internet. It turns me off. What do you think, Fenton? I, I mean, I agree about the pounding down, but I just, you know, I, I, I don't like the fact that she likes Trump. And I, I, it's okay to, to joke that her career's over, and I guess it's just one off-chance remark. But I was, I was shocked. I had no idea she was a Trump supporter. And I'm sorry, but I just don't think there's any excuse for it. And I think we're in such a critical situation that if you support Trump, 
you deserve to be called out. Sorry. And I, even more than that, don't you think, what was her purpose in telling people? No one really, like... She was being a bit of a shit stirrer, wasn't yeah, she? Yeah, yeah but, act, I mean, it was kind of dumb I mean, for her but, to even bring it up and ruin her career. I, I do understand that there are such things as fiscal conservatives who are, you know, they're Republican for a reason because they, they, want, they want... They, they like they, their money. They, yeah, they, like, they want their money. They want Wall Street to be, you know, de- deregulized and that, all that stuff. And I, I, I get all that, but I do agree with Fenton that now is not the time to even care about any of that. We're, we're, we're in such a dire situation. It feels awfully tone deaf to issues of race and women and all that kind of stuff. And interestingly, I always held sort of Suzanne Summers up because according to her and I've heard her talk about this and it moved me during uh, Three's Company when she was the biggest star in the world she had her husband her manager go to ABC like second season or something and say she wanted parody she wanted the same money as John Ritter and they didn't just laugh him out of the office. They f- put her on suspension. They shamed her. And then they held her to her contract. But the, if you remember, those of you who watched this company, for one season, she was visiting her like Aunt Sally. And they would just have they would just do a phone call with Suzanne Summers in the last minute of the show. And she talks about how she was brought onto the set, a separate set, a separate, you know, place in the dark, not allowed to talk to the like she was like, well, how dare you ask for equal pay? And she was ostracized by the producers and the network so and the why stars. is she now republican because republicans don't support equal pay they don't support equal rights and in fact all the money that she you know fine be a fiscal conservative but it's always about taking money out of the mouths of poor people snatching their health care and just you know, taking their jobs i mean it's, it's it's not like sure business is great but if you are doing it on the backs of of middle class poor people again it's like it, there's no excuse, right? I agree. It's I mean, greed, really. It because, feels it f- comes right. off as greedy, but they don't see it that way. It's so crazy, and, and to have somebody who you can see as an advocate and is gay friendly, and you know she's big friends with Barry Manilow, you'd think like she's one of us, and you realize in these times that that she's not. It, it was it was a Howard Dean moment, like where it was just you remember when he he did that weird he screamed, Woo! yeah, and it destroyed his career. It was just literally three seconds of her life that destroyed everything. And yet, but, but then again, you have someone like Lindsay Lohan who, or Paris Hilton who is going out and, and advocating Trump, and we still haven't have sort of held their feet to the fire because in the same way. They've never been as important as she was to us. As Paris a community. Hilton hasn't been as important as, as Suzanne Summers. Summers. I think she. she she was an advocate at a time when gay people were dealing with HIV and AIDS, and she was there for us. Paris Hilton has never been there for the gay community the way Suzanne Summers was, I feel. But, you know, she did that on purpose. She said, I'm a Trump supporter, my career is over, because she did that to spark a conversation about something. So I'm trying so hard not to be black and white, not to knee jerk, not to just not listen to the other but how side. How can you not? But how can you not? Yeah. Suzanne Summers. Yeah. Right. Go get something right. lifted. Go <laughs> get something lifted with your organic f- foods and things. All right, Blake, we have to take a quick bl- break, but no, before we Fenton do. No, does have to do anything? No, we just we heard from Fenton. What did Fenton talk? When you were on the phone not listening, <laughs> he was doing Karen a whole Carpenter. thing about Karen Carpenter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Blake, what do we have for a trivia question to take us to commercial? Who is the founder of the Sundance Film Festival? Oh, that's easy. Is it? Oh! Who is the founder of the Sundance Film Festival? We'll guess our answers when we come back. You're listening to The Wow Report on Radio Andy, Sirius XM. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. All right. We're back. It's Tom Campbell here with James St. James, our extra special guest, Morgan McMichaels, our uh, fabulous producer, Blake. Hi. Hi. And of course, live via FaceTime from Park City, Utah, the Sundance Film Festival, Fenton Bailey. Oh, my God. Look at you. (laughs) Uh, Before the break, we asked a little trivia question. Blake, could you repeat that, please? Yeah. Who is the founder of the Sundance Film Festival? Who is the founder (laughs) of the Sundance Film Festival? Feels like a... Silly, stupid, easy well, of answer to one me. One would think it would have to be Robert Redford. Robert Redford. But Redford. It's not obviously. What do you think? Who I was going to say Robert De Niro, but that's Tribeca, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I love it. It's a different answer. Uh, do you know, Fenton? If you know, you do. It's Robert, yeah, it's Robert Redford. It's Robert no, Redford, it no. who is still one of the most handsome men in Hollywood. It's, it's got to be someone else. It's got to be. It's got to be like Danny Trejo or something. <laughs> it's actually his name was Starling Van Wagener and John Earl. And uh, Robert Redford was the first board member, oh. board chairman. 
actually, Blake, of course you're right, because the festival actually began in 1978, and it wasn't called the Sundance Film Festival. It was only rebranded as that in 1981, and it was named Sundance, of course, after Robert Redford's that's, role. That's right. In the Sundance Kid. Thank you, Blake. We've all learned something today. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thank you I much. never even made the connection between Sundance Kid and Sundance. That's so... Funny yeah. that the, <laughs> ding, 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 the lights go on in Georgia. Here they are. Fabulous. All right. We are counting down the top 10 things this week that made us go, wow. wow. And what do we have, Fenton, at number four? Number four. Well, you know, uh, when I come to Sundance Film Festival, all I do really is see docs. And this year, the docs have been amazing. But there's two I wanted to talk about right now, um, which is sort of very different. I mean, I guess the thing about the docs always is, these characters, you know, the stronger the character, oftentimes, even if the film's a little wobbly, it's just an amazing treat. And there were two, two films I saw, two docs. One is uh, Chef Flynn, about this incredibly young chef who just, and I'll talk about him in a moment. The other, James, this is for you, is um, Vivian Westwood. Oh! Uh, Punk icon activist, and this film is just a delight. I mean, the thing is, you know, fashion. I love fashion documentaries, and they always have in them a sequence where the designer is working with the model, and it's always a very intense scene. He's fitting or he's cutting, and it's the artistry, it's the process exposed, and it's always sort of slightly fetishistic. Well, of course, you have this scene in this film, but Vivian's going, what the fuck is this? I, d- I designed this, I don't remember, I have no idea what this is, I hate it which is, you know, instead of all this sort of careful artistry, she's just like storming, uh, swearing like a stormtrooper. And (laughs) just this incredibly contrary, gnarly... I mean, the the film begins with her sitting in a chair saying, I don't want to talk about this fucking stuff. It's so fucking boring. Like, and it just goes on the match. She's always fighting in the interview saying, they ask her to talk about the sex pistols. And she's like, oh, God, I don't want to talk about that. Um... Of course she does, and it's it's quite a revealing thing because, you know, she was with Malcolm McLaren, right? Well, that relationship went really sour, and in fact, he really sabotaged her career, and it's a really... The Malcolm McLaren in this film is a complete asshole. But then, the amazing... Again, always in these documentaries, what makes them is some unexpected story, and she fell in love with, and he fell in love with her, this student from Austria called Andreas. James, do you know Andreas? No, I don't think I do. He has the most extraordinary accent. He's enormously tall, has this shaggy beard, and is every bit as compelling. And I, I think he's gay. So you've got this you've got this company that somehow, in spite of itself, manages to succeed. I mean, she now has, what, like 140 stores around the world? But unlike most other fashion brands, she is still in charge. It's hers. She's completely independent. Partly because I think no one would ever sponsor her. You know, so, <laughs> it's like World of Wonder. She, and someone at one point says in the film, she really is the one and only true punk. Because she never sold out. Because she's just so sort of... She's not nasty. She's just outspoken and, and doesn't play the game. And In fact, James, you probably know this as a designer. She's been really not respected and mocked and 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 really only recently has gotten recognition um someone talks about it as so she's the drunk auntie andreas her love is the gay uncle and then she employs all these delinquent teenagers and it is so dysfunctional and funny it's it's really it's really great i can't Um, wait to see it tell us a little bit about this chef flynn documentary oh chef flynn on the other you know God knows how old Vivian Westwood is. She's old. Uh, (laughs) Chef Flynn is 17 years old, and he has been cooking since the age of nine. Oh, I remember seeing him as a young kid. Uh, They would trot him out on Good Morning America and all those things, and he'd be like 10 years old. Yes. He's a chef prodigy, and his mom, bless her, recognized this and built for him in his bedroom a kitchen. So his whole bedroom at home is a kitchen. And he has a mattress he sleeps on on the floor. And it's, it's such an inspiring story. You know, I think there's a few people in life who know exactly who and what they are from the beginning. And Chef Flynn is one. Uh, you know, Oprah is another, I guess. <laughs> you know, 
And it's so enviable. You know, I'm still trying to figure I have no idea what I am or what I'm doing. And but, but and lovely the way the family support him. And um, the, the little girl, she was born and she was a little baby. And she said, I want a brother. I want a brother. And this brother came along that basically stole everything, all the attention. And oh, as so but, often happens, I know. As the youngest, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. But she's in, everybody's incredibly supportive. And in fact, at the premiere yesterday, he came up afterwards. There was lots of applause. And he announced that just two hours ago, his own permanent restaurant is opening in New York. And it's called At Jeff. At 17. Jem. And it's opening. And it's called. It, Jem is Meg. Which, his mother's name is Meg. And so it's called Jem, which is his mother's name backwards. Oh, isn't that sweet? And his sister owns it, technically, because he's too young to get a liquor license. So it's, this, <laughs> it's, it's a family this. affair, and he's he's so great. He um he uh, one of his dishes is is uh, beef Wellington. Ooh. You know what? Well, yes. beef Wellington is like beef wrapped in pastry, and he got the idea to do it with beets. So he's obsessed with beets. Beets so, Wellington. You know, it, it's just a great film. I I don't know, I don't know where it will be, but I, I'm sure it's going to come out soon. And I know Vivian Westwood is coming to um. I mean, did, Amazon, you, Amazon, did you say yeah. that Viv was there? What, was she or was she not? Uh, Vivian was not there, I don't believe. Or if she was, I didn't see her. I didn't see her. But, Very short. Oh, my God, what a fire, fire starter, right? right? Well, we, a, they say we live in a golden age of documentaries, and these sound like two more gems, Meg's Bell Backwards, true. that yeah. we should all look at. All did, right. you, wait, did you ever see the, the Marlena documentary, the Marlena Dietrich documentary that she made very late in life when, like, when she was in her late 80s, and it was mm -hmm. made by Maximilian Schell, and you just see her in, in shadow, you never see her face? That and I have to see. You you really have to see it because the whole movie they keep asking her about everything and she keeps saying it's kitsch. I, it's kitsch. I don't want to talk about that. I oh who cares about that? Who cares about those pictures? Who cares about those movies? And the whole the whole movie documentary yes. is her just saying that she's fighting give a, the documentary. Yeah, just saying I don't give a fuck about any of this. Right. I love. I think often the most successful docs are the one that sort of break the fourth wall in a sense, and that you, you they're fighting with the filmmaker and that that's all part of it. Because yes. When you really get to see someone as they are, and, and Vivian Westwood arguing every step of the way, she's like, "Oh no, I don't want to talk. The past is so boring." Yes, yes, I love yeah. all of that. Now, did she right. talk a little bit about because her son is another very controversial figure, the one that's shared with Malcolm McLaren, and he just right. burned all the punk memorabilia. Is any yeah. of that mentioned? Does she talk no, about? No, it's not mentioned. But she's in an interesting place right now. It's a bit of a dilemma because she got woke. She became turned on to environmental issues, and. But the paradox is, here she is, this sort of campaigner against global warming and rampant consumerism, yet ironically, of course, problematically, she's in the retail business. And she's all about selling things. And uh, making billions of dollars at this point in her career. Exactly. There's a hilarious scene, though, I have to say, where they, they're supposed to present to their buyers from around the world all their new clothes. And she walks in and says... You know, I just have to say, I don't like anything in the collection, so we're not showing you anything. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, uh, let's... Uh, people have come to Japan, and they're like, what, what? You know, and Andreas is like, where are the marketing people? <laughs> like, fabulously dysfunctional. It's amazing. Right. Really great. Well, thank you again, Fenton, coming to us live via FaceTime from Park City Sundance Film Festival. Let's move on to number three, James. Number three... I saw a fashion documentary on Netflix called Manolo Blahnik, The Boy Who Made Shoes for Lizards, I think is the name of the title. And, um, and I don't even think they even explain why they call it that, because I don't think he makes shoes for lizards. But, um, but you're sure you saw it? I, I, I think I saw it. I'm pretty sure I, I saw it. But it, it's, it's one of those really fa fascinating, and if you, if you ever have a documentary made about you, I suggest you go to the maker of this documentary, because it is one of those frothy, fizzy, just wonderful documentaries where every moment you're just swept along by the personality of this man. It's, 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 you don't have to care about shoes. You don't have to care about fashion or anything like that. He's just one of those great characters. There, you know, Andre Leontali is one of those talking voices. Uh, you know, Anna Wintour, um, all, all of those people. But he has a personality that is even bigger than Andre Leontali's. He is this one, he's, he's this sort of one of those gray, gay characters in the mold of, like, 
Cecil Beaton or Truman Capote or somebody like that, where you, you can just what every word out of his mouth is are these like Oscar Wildean utterances that are just I mean so fabulous to watch. He's um, dressed immaculately the entire time. He's always in these like sort of pastel like like coats with these shawls and things like that and he's always in capri or on a yacht somewhere <laughs> and he's just the whole movie is just him just chattering about his life and all these people from anna wintour and, and you know um you know kate and, and um naomi campbell and everybody i have no visual picture of him what oh, how wow. old is he these days well he's 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 old as the hills he's he's he's, 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 he's like in, our age he's in his 50s or 60s <laughs> something like that but um <laughs> but he was really a looker as a child. He was really young. And there are these pictures of him in the 1950s and 60s. And he's got this, he looks a bit like Troy Spano was a little bit, in fact. He's, he's this sort of like curly, with this mop of curly hair. And he's absolutely adorable. And now he's just this old man who's just very elegant and everything like that. But it's, it's it, you know, he was there in the 60s with, you know, um, uh, I, I don't even know, you know. Uh, all the people in the 60s. All the people in the jet, 60s. Jet set, darling. With, with the jet set, People yes. weren't even alive in the <laughs> 60s. Exactly. But it's just, it's, it's a really fun documentary, and I, I got to just, I can't talk about how enough about how just fun it is and how beautifully made it is and there's like all sorts of like um animation in it and it's just there there's the fashion and the shoes and of course most people know him just from sex in the city there's and, animation in it yeah 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 that's cool you weren't tripping this is actually <laughs> in the documentary maybe yeah, yeah, I, I don't know, know. I don't so know. and and this uh, documentary of manola blanc blonic is streaming on Netflix, not Hulu, right? This, this it, was, it is Netflix. This, is Netflix. I, this, is, this was the day before I got Hulu. Okay, so. all right. It's a whole. It, it's life has changed. <laughs> yeah. All sure. right. Let's move on to number two. Number two. Um, this uh, story is personal, you guys. Um, it's. I want to talk about my search for a new car. Because oh. I, because I, I, anyone who's seated and can't run away, I, I talk to. But I, my car, well, I've been, I've been driving a BMW 428 retractable hardtop convertible, which I love very much. The, the, it's up for the lease is up, and but it, so I had to get a few little body things done. It was taken away from me for over three months. I didn't have a car, and I had to rent a car, and then that ran out. So I started living life in LA uh, as uh, just walking. And taking the subway and taking a lot of lifts. You you take Uber. You you take the subway. Lift. I took the subway to the Women's March and things of that nature. So I like whatever. I was trying to like do different things. And can I just report back? One of my options here? for not having a car uh, two miles down the street. Okay. So part of me is like, you know what? Walking is great. I've been losing a little bit of weight. The walking has helped. But I also got in the back seat of a Chevy Bolt. Bolt with a B as in boy, not the Chevy Volt. Now, Theron here has the Volt, or used to, which is the hybrid Chevy, which has got a lot of things. The Bolt is the least designed car on the face of the earth. It's like four <laughs> wheels and four doors. I pointed it out to Fenton. I was like, this might be my next car. And he and Randy were together. And they both, without even like having an attitude, they was like, no! Like, <laughs> you can't get that car. What's amazing about it, you know, there's all this hoopla. And I'm also considering the Tesla 3, just so you know, Fenton, because Fenton is a big Tesla S driver um, from the very beginning, an early adapter. Um, <laughs> But the the bolt is is you know Tesla claimed it was going to have the longest range uh, mass produced car and it was going to be in the Tesla three. Um, Chevy has beaten them to the punch. I went to Keys 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 Van Eyes, eyes yeah. to tr test drive it, and while it lacks style, it um it uh, it it gets two hundred and like forty miles per charge. It uh, it's it's base price is about thirty five thousand dollars. That's before like the, the you get the redu you know the, the before they put the seats in. Yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> and I was in love. But here's the one thing I brought my friend Will, who's a total car snob, and the whole way to the valley, he's like, "Why are we going to Chevrolet?" Um, but here's the thing: in the in the slightly more expensive one that starts at forty two or something, where a rear view mirror should be, is a monitor. So it's a high def TV screen that's long and narrow that you don't see reflection. You are watching through a camera in the back. 
it's basically a computer on wheels. Right? Yes, exactly right. Or, or a microwave or something. It's really not stylish. But I, that I'm telling you, when when they're selling that car, they should just pay attention to that rearview mirror monitor because that's all you're talking about. You're not looking at the road. You don't care what the car is performing. <laughs> so now, why are you more excited about the Bolt than anything else? Because it's an underdog, I guess. Because I discovered it. Because it costs less. Because I'm trying. I'm just trying to figure out. I was stripped of a car, so I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna buy into the. But you the were petty, so petty, Fenton and Ren. I'm just teasing. The um, you know, <laughs> the, the status of cars. But, but, but you are you somebody who, who is a status. I'm a uh, car like person. anybody who struggles. I'm I'm like spiritual because I'm trying to get away from my darkness. I I am going to the Chevy Bolt to try to get away from my 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 crass mer- 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 commercialism. So, so if you, this is your decision. You're going with Bolt, right? No, because I change my mind every day. Uh, I go from thinking I'm not going to have a car, which is still an option, to the Bolt, which makes me feel very better than everyone. And then the third thing is i went that same day that we saw the bolt my friend will and i we went to one of two places in southern california where you can see the tesla three two places one in northern california and one at the century city mall and we got there and the century city mall has been newly designed a billion dollar remake oh, and it's but, like oh but it's it's, it's, it's the most confusing place i on hate Earth. that mall it's what i imagine um um, um what's the, what's the the the, the uh, uh runner sp- um What's the movie with about the future with Harrison Ford? Uh, Blade Runner. Blade Runner 2049. <laughs> it's like it's like I have no now, idea what's I going on. I remember one time I went there though with my sister who was pregnant and she was about to give birth and we got lost she in the parking. She gave birth there, right? And, and literally we <laughs> wandered around and then she, her water was about to break and we literally wandered around screaming and crying because we could not find the car. Still the same. It, yes. But I found the, the 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 Tesla thing there. There was a line around the block, so we couldn't even just to sit in the Tesla three, not to test drive it. But I looked at it. And what the Tesla says it starts at 3,500, the Tesla 3. But by the time, everyone's saying by the time you get it to like have wheels and a battery that works, you're spending 50 to 55, which, okay. So, but I, peering through the window, it was like the microwave on wheel, the Chevy Bolt, or this beautifully designed Tesla 3. But of course, the catch is, and I'm Mr. You know, immediate gratification, the waiting list, because I didn't get on it, is now a year to a year and a half. And so, and then just this morning, I got after a three month breakup, I got back into my BMW and I'm like, this is a pretty nice car. So I have nothing, but I do think the Chevy Bolt B, as in boy, is something that you should look into. It, it's it's uh, it makes me happy. I'm sure it's built all over the world, but it makes me happy that Chevrolet, that America has made this thing, and it make, gives me hope that we're all going to be driving electric very soon. Um, well, is your no, BMW we're gonna be driving electric? soon because we're going to be having self-driving cars, so the whole we'll auto be riding industry, electric. Yeah, the, very whole, soon. the whole auto industry is about to collapse. All right, all right. Well, so, James, at your age, you'll be getting in the van. You know, oh, getting in the van, up at the elevator in the van. Yeah. Someone speaks the truth here. At Wheeled the table. into the back. Oh. Still looking fantastic, though. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Let's, I know we invited you for a reason, Morgan. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we have to take a break. We'll be back shortly to reveal the number one thing that made us go wow in the wow. resistor of the week. You are watching and listening to the Wow Report on Radio Andy Sirius XM. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. All right, welcome back to the Wow Report here on Radio Andy, Sirius XM. So excited this week to have Morgan McMichael from RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars 3 with us, along with James St. James, our producer Blake, and live via FaceTime from Park City, from the Sundance Film Festival, Fenton Bailey. Hi. Wearing his ski hat inside. So I'm wondering, is there any sweating going on now? I'm not baking. I'm like a baked potato. <laughs> you I look... hope the sun is giving the glittery. I hope you're getting this glitter sequin action. You have a lovely. You're, you're, you're facing the window, is that right? Yes, the sun's pouring in. And your camera is on the, the, the ironing board in the room? Yes. <laughs> this is all behind the scenes. This is part of the documentary we'll be doing about Fenton I'll and Sundance. I'll a picture of the setup. <laughs> Please do. All right, we have come to that point, that, that the moment that I think everyone listening waits for every week. We're going to reveal the number one thing oh, that made oh us go. Oh, my God, Whoa. here we go. What, what, was there, uh, someone's oh. gone. Someone's gone. Oh, Fenton is starting to I'm freeze. In, yeah, no, I had an incoming call. Which I oh, okay. We'll, well, I will talk to you later. Number one. Number one 
Let's talk about the Oscar nominations. Oh. Well, I think in, in more importantly is let's talk about the, the, the non-Oscar nominations, the people who yeah. are snubbed. The because snubs. there's so many big... I mean, I, I'm very excited about Laurie Metcalf getting uh, the nomination. Supporting for, actress. Yeah, her, she, it's, it, it looks like the supporting actress category is the one to watch because it's Alice and Janney versus Laurie Metcalf. Yes. We're two beloved actresses. I cannot absolutely wait. I no. took a poll on the New York Times app uh, last night, and Alice and Janney is... She's uh, going to... Yeah, I love her. But did, did any people of color actually get nominated this year? Um, there were some. Denzel and Washington was, was nominated Over again. Oh, and, and, uh, interestingly, Mary J. Blige is another one to yes. watch okay. for Mud for Mud Honey. What was that? Mud Mud, 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 Mud Bound. Yeah. yeah. Mud Mudbound. Mud, Mudbound, and um, uh, and so she's that that also is for best supporting actress. Yes. But. <gasps> Uh, Gal Gadot, Gal, Gal Gadot, I believe, <laughs> is, uh, we are not allowed to call her Gadot. Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman was, and Patty Jenkins was not nominated for Best um, Director, which is sort of a, a huge snub, because she she is the first woman director to have made a billion-dollar movie. She's she, you know, she broke a billion glass ceilings, and she really sort of came out of nowhere to, to become an A-lister this year. But, of course, you know, the, the Academy tends to hate uh, blockbusters, right? They don't seem to reward um, superheroes. Right. They don't movie. like blockbusters, which is 90% of the business, and they don't like comedies, even though right. uh, Get Out did get some recognition, which I'm happy. And not that Get Out is much more than a comedy. But you know what was snubbed and call me superficial? Girls Trip. It was everything. That was so funny. <laughs> Get close to the mic. But, but now explain to me why you would think that Girls Trip would be a an Oscar-bound movie. I feel like Tiffany Haddish, see. who announced the Oscars. Did you see that by any chance while you were traveling? It was a little early in the morning. Yes, but it's online. But Tiffany oh. Haddish was one of the presenters at 5 in the morning reading the things. She mispronounced. She was, she was America. She was me. She mispronounced everyone's name. She <laughs> messed up all the titles of the movies with love. She made jokes. When, when um, <laughs> they announced that Baby Boss, that animated movie, was, was announced that was the happiest she was. And she kept getting uh, three billboards uh, outside Ebbing, Missouri wrong. She's like, And finally she's like, you know what? I need to see that movie. That sounds like a good movie. Everyone keeps seeing it. But I also thought she was hilarious. In Girls Trip, I, you know, I go back to the power to make someone laugh. The ability to make someone laugh is such a talent that seems to be a little underrepresented. Anyway. I do see that Timothy Chalamet did get nominated for Best Actor, was it? Yes, but yeah, uh, but Army. Uh, Army did not. Correct. Which I feel is sort of fitting, but that's that that stands here and there. Um, I, I also see that. Um, uh, Dunkirk. I think Dunkirk. I would say that Dunkirk is the one to beat, but I don't think it's going to get. I think it's going to. It be, was a good movie. I yeah, liked it. I, I think it's going to. I am. Well, and lost. Shape of Water got thirteen nominations. It's going to yes. be Shape. It's Shape of Water's years. I walked out of Shape of Water. This I didn't. I didn't watch see the whole thing. Wow. I didn't either. I was over it. Yeah. All right. Um, well, we'll, but Lady we'll, Bird was good. Lady Bird, Bird, yeah, was good. that's what we want. But and also, um, I'm a little tired of uh, the um the what is it the um Gary Oldman um. Winning oh, for the Winston, Winston Churchill. Winston, yeah, that holds absolutely. I feel like we've saw it in the crown. I don't think we need but any I more. Love him. But, but one of the biggest snubs was uh, Jane in the documentaries. That's right. Uh, you know, the amazing documentary um, about um, Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall, yeah. I mean, it's an incredible film, and it was on the shortlist. And it, it makes you realize that really the Oscars, and especially so in the documentaries, it's just a popularity contest. Yeah. And it's not really very honorable. The whole thing is just a bit. But you I know, thought that's what the Golden Globes were, and that the Oscars were the. Yeah, this is why personally I hate award shows. I think they're like they just make everybody unhappy. Except for the Emmys, in which we've been winning lots yes, of lately. We love the yeah. Emmys. We love the <laughs> Critics' Choice Awards. We love the Nappy Awards. I'm not <laughs> winning an award. Don't <laughs> right. Don't get me wrong. But the Oscars are very telling because like. It, they always have them on the Sunday, and every year in Palm Springs, it used to be a huge to-do. Right. And, it, you know, no one would go out. We would cancel shows yeah, yeah, because yeah. we'd be at these massive Oscar parties, and nobody does them anymore because it's just not a thing. It's not. It doesn't match the popular taste, and I think that's a— they're out that, of touch. That, yeah. But there, are, there, there was some diversity in the nomination, so at least a step in the right direction. Well, we are running out of time. I'm sorry. We have to uh, reveal the resistor of the week— the millions and millions of women and men allies who marched at the yes. Women's March on Sunday. I was part of the L.A. March. 600,000 strong is reported. It feels like the whole Women's March, which I know had more momentum last year because it came the day after the inauguration, got a lot of press. It felt a little underreported. 
this time. Yeah, it's true. They, they were saying that it got uh, like a total of 20 seconds on CNN. It got like every it was really all the places that it should have been really mentioned. It really wasn't. And I don't know if that's just because we've done it before or uh, whether it's just, you know, fatigue. I have no idea. But when, you, but when you add up all the people who attended all the marches across the states, isn't it the largest demonstration yes. in history? Yes, around the world. Yeah. Yes, America. they're saying. Exactly. So congratulations to everybody yes. who got up and out and thank you. Um, I'm supposed to do a lot of plugs now, and this is where I start to choke. But I just want to remind you that RuPaul's Drag Con is coming to L.A. Oh, yes. uh, May 11th. 11th, 12th, and 13th. Will you be there? I will be there. You having a booth? I have a booth. I have two booths, actually. <laughs> two gonna, booths? I, th- I am going to have two booths, and I'm just going to have this kind of area where people can sit the fuck down. I love Instead it. of standing That's in good. lines. And just, you know, chill out and be like, hey, Morgan, I hate you. I or love I love it. you. It's, it's about multiple booths this year. It's yeah. like double wide trailers. Dear God. Um, I didn't know. The other thing is Trix- Trixie and Katya is back on Viceland. Viceland. Oh, my God, I'm obsessed Wednesday with Wednesday nights at 10 p.m. And if we haven't said it once, we'll say it again. Morgan McMichael, one of the all-stars on RuPaul's Drag Race, All-Stars 3 on VH1, 8 p.m. Don't miss it. Every Thursday, yeah. On Thursdays, yeah. yep. Thursdays, thanks. All right, you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Fenton. Thank you, Fenton. Yes. Will back, you- back into the theaters for you, young man. Bye, sweeties. Wait, will you be back next week? Will we see you next week? Same time, same place. He is week. never. Oh, it's Billy. Hey, Hi. Billy. <laughs> He's never coming back to the office now that he knows that he can, right? can beam it in. All right. Thank you, Morgan McMichael. Thank, 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 thank you, James James. Thank, thank you, Blake. Everybody watching, everyone listening. Until the next time, go out and do something that makes the world go wow. wow. Bye.